Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black cow. Boone is here with me, and we're going to be here on CBS Sports Network for the next hour. We're talking college basketball now that the 2023-24 season is officially in the books after last night's national championship game that went exactly like Every other game, UConn has played in the NCAA tournament over the past two years. Final score, UConn 75, Purdue 60. So Dan Hurley's Huskies, they are back-to-back champions. They've now won 12 straight games. It's incredible. By at least 13 points in the NCAA tournament. Strong jaw, you were inside State Farm Stadium last night to, to witness UConn's victory in person. Were you surprised at all that it went as easily as it went for the Huskies? Yeah, yes and no, I think is my answer here. Yes, in that Purdue is a great team. Um, They had a great player in Zach Eady, and they had a great season. Uh, I think, you know, if if UConn does not exist, Purdue is a national championship. No, obviously, in that UConn was an all-time great team. Um, And I'm sure we'll get to that here in a little bit. But this UConn team has been thoroughly dismantling teams in the NCAA tournament for two straight years now. And this is not something uh, that came as a surprise, even against a really good Purdue team that was led by Zach Eady. Eady had an incredible performance. Uh, But UConn just has been an absolute wagon during this NCAA tournament, during last year's NCAA tournament. All six of its games in this year's NCAA tournament coming by double, double figures in wins. Same for last year. I mean, this is a this is a Connecticut team that is on an all-time heater right now, um, beating a Purdue team even as good as this Boilermakers team is by 15 points on the biggest stage. You know, I think it would generally register as a surprise, but just because we know how good this UConn team is, how dominant they've been, it's not that surprising to see them do this to e- to even a good team like Purdue. I think you've got it exactly right. Like, um, there's no computer you're going to find that had UConn beating Purdue by 15 points. Um, There's no, uh, uh, you know, point spread you're going to find that suggested this should be a a 15-point game. Uh, If we are in agreement still that Purdue was the second best team in the country, and I think most people are, then you just very rarely expect the number one team in the country to be able to handle the number two team in the country as easily as UConn was able to handle Purdue. But that is what happened last night. So it it shouldn't, um, it it, it should be a surprise on some level for all the reasons I I just laid out. But when you just focus in on UConn and say, Hey, they've been doing this to everybody. It doesn't matter who they're playing. It doesn't matter what the point spread is. It doesn't want to matter what any computer says. You put them on the court for 40 minutes, and this is what they do to everybody. Um, all season, finished at 37-3. and three. They win all six games in this NCAA tournament by at least 13 points, the championship game by 15. They won all uh, six games in last season's NCAA tournament uh, by at least 13 points. As Dan Hurley had said, leading up to this monumental achievement, we've been able to make a hard tournament look easy. And they, I guess to simplify it, made last night what should have been a hard game and what would have been a hard game for literally anybody else in the country, they made it look easy. And so, again, the idea that they could do this on this stage after losing everything they lost last season and they just run through a second straight NCAA tournament. Super impressive stuff. And I thought, though all of the attention heading in, or at least a lot of the attention heading in, was on the matchup between Donovan Klingon and, and Zach Eady because Klingon is perhaps going to be the first college big selected in the 2024 NBA draft. And Zach Eady is, of course, your two-time national college player of the year. I really did think, and I said this on yesterday's Ion College Basketball Podcast, that the game could be decided in the backcourts, not in the front court, mm-hmm. And I think that's what happened. Zach Eady did what he does and did it better than he usually does it. He got 37 and 10 points in a national championship game. He will forever be um, on the list of greatest March Madness runs of all time, at least from a statistical perspective. But that wasn't enough to get it done against UConn. And the reason that wasn't enough to get it done against UConn is because Purdue's guards got overwhelmed by UConn's guards. And this is something we had discussed heading into it as a possible problem for the Boilermakers. It's not just that Tristan Newton's going to play in the NBA someday and Braden Smith probably isn't, or that Cam Spencer's going to play in the NBA someday and Lance Jones probably isn't. 
or that Stefan Castle is going to be a lottery pick this summer and that Fletcher Lawyer isn't. It's that that those three players, Newton, Spencer, Castle, they're bigger at each position than Smith, Jones, and Lawyer. Tristan Newton is six foot five. Brain Smith, six foot. Cam Spencer, six four. Lance Jones is six one. Stefan Castle, six five. Fletcher Lawyer, six four. And that showed up very early and never went away last night. Evidence being that Purdue only took seven three pointers in the entire game. They were one of seven from three. That's obviously a terrible percentage, 14.3%. But the 14.3% isn't necessarily what killed Purdue. It was the only seven attempts. UConn, quite obviously, in a game plan, decided we're going to let Zach Eady do what he does, and we're going to try our best to guard him one-on-one. But our priority will not be to prevent Zach Eady from scoring around the rim. Our priority is going to be to not let Purdue's guards get three-point shots off, and we're going to limit them from that from that point on the court and make it where if Zach Eady's going to beat us, then Zach Eady's going to really have to do something crazy, crazy, because the guards aren't going to do it. Purdue finishes one of seven from three. Fletcher Lawyer didn't make a shot in the game. And just to put, um, you know, some context with this, Purdue entered the game shooting above 40% from three. It's the second best three-point percentage in the entire country. And they don't take them as much as, say, Alabama, but they make them as well as just about anybody else. And in this game, they couldn't do anything, and they couldn't even get the shots off. And it broke a streak that's incredible. I'll give credit to to Anthony Billis, who um, does research for us at CBS Sports Network. He got right in my ear last night after I asked him and told me that before last night's game, Purdue had played 330 straight college basketball games while taking at least eight three-pointers in each of them. Last night, they only got seven. That is not an accident. It's not a coincidence. Dan Hurley, mm -hmm. Luke, Moore, uh, Luke Murray, uh, Kamani Young, and that UConn coaching staff put together an incredible game plan that took away something very important from Purdue. And once it was clear that was taken away, it was obvious Purdue was going to have a hard time winning that game. Which is crazy to think about, GP, because essentially, and we talked to Dan Hurley after the game, and Hurley said, we didn't want to give up threes. That was our main priority. That was our defensive game plan. And we didn't care if Zach Eady, the best player in college basketball, took over this game. We didn't care if he took 25 plus shots to get 30 plus points. Their goal was to limit Purdue's guards. They thought that if Edie could score 30 points, they don't know where the rest of the points are going to come from. Is, is Fletcher Lawyer going to have a big game? Is Braden Smith going to have a big game? They're okay kind of living with that, just knowing Edie's going to get his, but they don't think anyone else can, can compliment um, Edie in, in a way that would, you know, produce winning for Purdue. Um, you know, after the game, Tristan Newton, you know, basically said, like, look, they they have a math problem. He did Edie doesn't shoot threes. Um, if he makes 15 two-point shots, that's 30 points. Where are the rest of the points coming from? And that was exactly how UConn executed this game plan. They were fine living with uh Edie and Klingon going one-on-one, -on -one, even if Edie is you know making shots and and scoring 37 points. They were fine with that. They were fine with Braden Smith living in mid-range shots. Um, just because, from a numbers perspective, if this Purdue team, which is top 10 in three-point shooting, is not shooting threes, and you know this, this defense for UConn is not slacking off and sagging off and helping Edie, they really thought that they could win with that game plan and obviously win by 15 points, and, and they, they really executed this defensive game plan uh, to perfection and, and essentially Purdue I think kind of played into UConn's hand because they settled for what UConn gave them in this game which was mid-range shots and and one-on-one -on -one isolation plays in the post with Zach Eady. Um, yeah I think they probably should have tried something else obviously but Purdue's defense I think you or UConn's defense I think you have to give them credit just because it was so good um, throughout this entire game Purdue really just did not have an answer for it. One last thing for you before we move on to a broader conversation. Tristan Newton, the uh, All-American guard, was named Most Outstanding Player of the Final Four. I don't have an issue with it, but there were some folks who said, listen, Tristan Newton was perhaps the best player on the best team, but the Most Outstanding Player of this Final Four was clearly Zach Heady, undeniably from a statistical perspective. Should Zach Heady have been the Most Outstanding Player of the Final Four even while losing? 
I don't think I could go that far. Um, he was it, the thing is, he was definitely the best player in the Final Four. Uh, he was the most outstanding player. So, you know, if you, if you want to take kind of letter of the law, yes, yeah, Zach Eady was the Final Four most outstanding player. He was the blessed best player um, in the NCAA tournament. I have a hard time rewarding the losing team in the national championship game. Um, and so I, you know, I think it's a, it's, it's fair to give it to Tristan Newton. I think there was a strong case that you could give it to Donovan Klingon as well. Um, statistically, maybe not as good as Tristan Newton, but his defense throughout this entire NCAA tournament for UConn, a team that was dominant with its offense and with its defense led by Klingon. Um, I think he had a real case as well. You can make a case for Zach Eady. And, you know, I think if you wanted to, I know you're 60% Boilermaker. If you wanted to make a case for Zach Eady, I wouldn't push back too strongly on that. Uh, but I think Tristan Newton being rewarded here was the right call. Yeah, I, I'm with you. Like it, it, it didn't even occur to me. Like as I'm, you know, watching the game and getting ready to uh, do our post game show last night on CBS no Sports Network, that like it should actually be a conversation. Should we give it to whoever we decide is UConn's best player because UConn's the best team clearly, or Zach Eady is having a historically incredible. Uh, NCAA tournament, a historically incredible Final Four. Should you just focus on that and hand it to him? But once the conversation gets started, from a literal sense, like, okay, just let's let's answer the question. Who is the most outstanding player in Glendale, Arizona, over the course of a three-day period? Well, that was Zach Eady. Like, it's not even a debate. I'm not going to debate it with anybody. But we do, um, per tradition, typically go with best player from best team. And that's not just in college basketball. That's in every sport. And if Tristan Newton um, is holding the trophy at the end, recognized as best player from best team, well, that's fitting given the way this year unfolded. Sure, Klingon had a, a case uh, to be most outstanding player of the Final Four, but ultimately I do believe that Tristan Newton was the most important player at UConn this season. I thought he should have been the, the Big East player of the year, even though he wasn't. And I didn't mind as a consolation prize, with a bigger prize, him holding a a trophy on Monday night. Uh, he'll forever be remembered as the most outstanding player of the 2024 NCAA tournament. Of course, last season for UConn, that person was Adama Sonogo. When we come back, I want to focus on the historical relevance of what UConn just did. I was asked an interesting question post game on CBS Sports Network last night. I'm going to ask the same question to Kyle Boone next. You're watching the Ion College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast. I'm Gary Parrish. Cal Boone is here with me. And last night, post game, on our one hour show on CBS Sports Network, I was on the court with my best buddy, Brent Stover, and we were talking about some of the, the great dynasties in college basketball, in other words, programs that have won, you know, back to back national championships before. And the way it was presented to me is what we just watched this incredible, Incredible UConn team that just rolled through the NCAA tournament for the second straight time, finishes 37-3. and three. Is this the best and or most dominant college basketball team we've seen since John Wooden's run of incredible and dominant UCLA teams a long time ago? How would you answer that question, Calvo? I think the answer is yes, right? Uh, this is a dominant UConn team. This is a dominant run. Uh, this is their 12th consecutive NCAA tournament win by double figures. Um, according to CBS Sports Research, second best points per game differential in a two-year span in NCAA tournament history. Uh, that's 21.7, if you're keeping track at home, behind 1967-1968 UCLA, uh, which was 22.5 points. Um, this is the second instance of a team winning six games in the NCAA tournament by in the NCAA tournament by 13 points or more. Uh, the last time that happened, Gary Parrish, you have to go all the way back to last year. That was the 2023 <laughs> Connecticut Huskies. So, uh, yeah, I, th I think you can make a very strong case, and I would. I think this is the the most dominant team uh, since you know the last couple of decades. Um, and obviously, you know, they have the hardware to back it up, back-to-back -back national championships, the first time since Florida did it in 2006, 2007, the Connecticut Huskies. Yeah, this is, uh, this is an all-time heater right now, and they are not done. I will tell you, Wally Zerbiak said that he thinks that it is. I was a little more nuanced in my answer because I just think it's very difficult to start 
you know, comparing basket college basketball teams over different eras and different generations, not only because, you know, players, you know, as, as the, the, we move forward, uh, you know, players tend to over decades, you know, be bigger, stronger, faster, more athletic, more skilled. Um, so that might give an advantage to a current team. Uh, but then you look back and say the early eighties when college basketball players stayed in college, um, more, uh, longer than, than they certainly do now. Like once upon a time you could get, you know, uh, years and years and years of Patrick Ewing. Well, you would never have that today. So mm -hmm. I, I, you know, you, you just, on one hand, I hear you. On the other hand, there's a North Carolina team in 1982 that had Michael Jordan, James Worthy and Sam Perkins, like what? So I, when you start trying to talk, uh, in 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 and have conversations about whether you know uh, this UConn team we w just watched could get on the court with Michael Jordan and Sam Perkins and James Worthy. I think that becomes a very difficult conversation to have. But in terms of let's just say modern era, past 20, 25 years, you know, last night was the 21st Final Four that I've attended. This weekend has been the 21st Final Four that I've I've attended, going all the way back to I believe 2003. My first Final Four was in New Orleans, the Carmelo Anthony Syracuse victory. And you start comparing this UConn team to any of those teams. I still don't know that you land at a place where this UConn team is clearly better than any other team we've seen in the past 20 or 25 years. But I think then 37 and three with the way they ran through this NCAA tournament, ran through the Big East, ran through the Big East tournament as well. I think then you can start to have a serious conversation that we what we've been watching over the past five months, and especially over the past three or four weeks, has been undeniably one of the best in the modern era. And, and maybe you could put them right at the top. Yeah, and, and I think you too, have, you have to kind of put into context what this UConn team was last year and what this UConn team is this year. I mean, they lost Andre Jackson. They lost Jordan Hawkins. They lost Adama Sanogo. Um, two of those players were drafted in the NBA. And to not only run it back, but run it back essentially by replacing a majority of your starting lineup, that's not likely to be replicated anytime soon. The transfer portal era, what we've seen in college basketball with so many different player movements, um, each team in college basketball frequently is turning over its roster every single year. The, the, the idea of continuity in college basketball is, is, is frankly almost dead. And UConn has decided to kind of lean into that. They they built their roster anew, essentially, from, from last year's title team. Uh, they went out in the transfer portal. They added some guys. They, they built in different roles for last year's players that – moved from you know bit players to to bigger pieces and you know just the way that they built this team the way that Dan Hurley constructed this roster and put together two consecutive title winning teams uh, i can't imagine we we will see a, a run like this over a two year span replicated just because of the unique way in which college basketball the landscape is currently constructed and to me, the most amazing thing about it isn't that they won a national championship, lost three of their top six scores, including two top 40 picks in the NBA draft, which doesn't even include Adama Sanogo, who was the most outstanding player of the 2023 Final Four. It's not just that they did this. It's that they lost all that. Then they remade the roster. We all looked at it. We all looked at it. None of us thought it was a national championship roster. I mean, what, you know, did you ever at one point in the preseason say, I think UConn's going to repeat? I, I, I don't think you did. No. I know I didn't. I had I didn't really hear anybody else do it either. And so this isn't a UConn team that after winning the 2023 tournament was obviously set up to win the 2024 NCAA tournament. They were picked third in the preseason Big East Bowl. They weren't even supposed to win the Big East or finish second in the Big East. So for Dan Hurley and his staff to do this in the way that they did it, I think is what makes it even more impressive. And I would argue, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this as well, that it is more impressive than the last time we had a back-to-back -back national champion. And that, of course, is Billy Donovan's Florida Gators in 2006, 
2007. Now, I'm not here to take anything away from Florida's two-year run that resulted in two national championships. I covered them both. It was amazing. Spent a lot of time in Gainesville over those two years. Uh, I remember it fondly. Interestingly, did you realize this? Florida's two-year record while winning back-to-back -back national championships, 68-11. and 11. UConn's two-year record while winning back-to-back -back national championships, 68-11. and 11. It's the exact same record, but it's done differently. Because when Florida won a national championship, and I heard some people talking about this, you know, in recent weeks, that like Dan Hurley had reached out to Bob, uh, Billy Donovan um, and wanted to pick his brain about, you know, how he repeated and what does it take to repeat. And jokingly, because it's always more complex than the joke, but jokingly, um, hey, Billy Donovan, how do you repeat? Okay. Get Torian Green, Lee Humphrey, Corey Brewer, Al Horper, Joe Kim Noah, Walter Hodge, Chris Richard to be your top seven. Okay, win, win it with them. Win it with them once, once. All right, and then what? Bring them all back and do it again. Okay, got it. That's not what UConn did. Florida brought back their top seven, plus the same head coach, same assistant coach, and they just did the same thing that they did the year earlier. UConn did it with different pieces. UConn did it without being a preseason number one. UConn did it in a way that most of us didn't see coming until this season actually started. And that's why, again, not to take anything away from Billy or what Florida accomplished, but if we are, you know, if the question is a simple one, what's more impressive, Florida's back-to-back -back or UConn's back-to-back? -back? Respectfully, I think it's pretty clearly UConn's back-to-back. -back. Yeah, I, t I tend to agree with you, GP. And shout out to Cam Salerno, who's a CBS Sports writer, for a college basketball team, he actually did an article on cbssports.com ranking uh, kind of the repeat champions that we've had in college basketball history. And he ranked Connecticut number one over Florida. And I tend to agree. Um, and largely because Dan Hurley was asked this question last night. I think I tend to agree with him as well because of this title team and what they had to replace from last year's title team. You don't replace Adama Sanogo, Andre Jackson Jr., Jordan Hawkins, and repeat as national champions. That, that just doesn't happen. Uh, Florida, you know, when they won it in 2006 and 2007, to your point, you know, they brought back Corey Brewer. They brought back Joe Kim Noah. They brought back Al Horford, Torian Green, Lee Humphrey. The majority of those pieces for the title team that they won in 2006 came back the next year. And that was a different era in college basketball. Now there is so much player movement. You know, this UConn roster, again, was turned over for the most part. They brought some pieces back and, and they've elevated some pieces. They brought some people in from the transfer portal. Uh, but doing it in the way they did it, because, yes, obviously, Billy, Billy Donovan, you, you're going to bring back the same team that won the national championship. That is a recipe for a repeat. If you have the best team one year and you bring it back, there's a good chance that you're going to win the, the title again next year. Uh, but doing it the way that they did it for this UConn team, um, you know, the way that they constructed this roster defensively, the way they improved offensively, I mean, both offensive and defensive efficiency this season, both top five uh, finished in the season. Uh, just a complete dominant team, uh, very balanced. You know, they don't really have star power, I wouldn't say necessarily. Um, you know, I, th I think Zach Eady was the best player in the final four, but in any given night, Stefan Castle could show up, Donovan Klingon could show up, Tristan Newton could have a big night, Cam Spencer. I mean, the depth of this team is laughable, and I think that's what makes this UConn team, this title team, and this repeat uh, so special for me. When we come back, we will turn our attention to Purdue. What does a host Zach Eady world look like? In West Lafayette, should Matt Painter, after what happened last night, address his backcourt? We'll get into that next. CI on College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to the Ion College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. I'm Gary Parrish. That's Cal Boom. Purdue season, I guess by definition, everybody's season is now over. It ends in a national championship game with the loss. So over the past two years, Purdue has had the National Player of the Year in Zach Eady. They've won multiple Big Ten titles, made it to the Final Four for the first time since 1980. Uh, but last night was obviously disappointing because, you know, as the second half got underway and UConn started to pull away, it was clear that uh, Purdue was not going to be able to to win this national championship. And the issues were in the backcourt. 
where Braden Smith and Fletcher, Fletcher Lawyer um, did not perform uh, well uh, relative to the way they performed, for the most part, through their first two ye uh, years at Purdue. Both were sophomore guards. Presumably, both will be junior guards next season. But Braden Smith is six foot, and Fletcher Lawyer is uh, six foot four. And in between them this year, they had Lance Jones, who's now out of eligibility, but he was only six one. In other words, after last season's disappointment that lost to Fairleigh Dickinson, Matt Painter said he knew he needed to add shooting, needed to add some athleticism, and he went out and did some of that. Do you think Matt Painter, Matt, Matt Painter rather, now thinks that he needs to add size to his backcourt and that he'll try to address it in the transfer portal? I guess what I'm asking you is, can you keep moving forward with such a small backcourt? Because even if you can clearly win Big Ten titles with it, they've done it two straight years, it does look like eventually – like, however your path is through an NCAA tournament, eventually, in this thing, you are probably going to run into NBA guards with better size and athleticism, and that's a real issue for them. Yeah, I think it's going to be an evolving equation for this Purdue team because, you know, we we asked Matt Painter earlier this week, like, what's your roster construction formula? How do you go about building your team? And essentially, I think, as as most coaches would say, we build around kind of our best player. When Carson Edwards was their best player, they built a system that functioned properly around him. When Zach Eady has been their best player, they built a system that could properly function around them. The shortcoming of this team was they didn't have the size to compete with UConn. And when UConn and its length with Stefan Castle at six foot five, Tristan Newton at six foot six is defending, you know, Braden Smith at six foot and Fletcher Lawyer, who's just around that same height. Uh, they just decided we're going to take away the three point shot and we're going to make you play from mid range. Uh, when you can effectively be taken out of one element of your offense entirely, that is going to be a problem. So undeniably, I think Matt Painter will go back to the drawing board this offseason. They're going to figure out what they're going to build around. I think they'll probably go to the transfer portal and see that they had some shortcomings with their length, with their size. And I think Brad, Braden Smith, Fletcher Lawyer, those guys will be able to take a step forward. But also I think that this Purdue staff will try to build some pieces around what they already have in place in hopes of rebuilding for next season. If you're wondering who replaces Zach Eady, he's probably a guy already on the roster. I think they just slide Trey Kaufman Wren over to center. And I think he'll have a breakthrough season. Like when you're talking about breakout candidates in college basketball, all those Zach Eady shots and points and rebounds are, they're gone now. Somebody's got to score them. Somebody's got to grab them. Trey Kaufman Wren's not going to match Eady, you know, point for point, rebound for rebound, block for block. But I think he'll be, be one of the better bigs in the Big Ten. And that's why, though we will discuss the top 25 and one in more detail toward the end of the show i'll go ahead and tell you i've got purdue ranked in the top 10 um, heading into uh, this off season even without uh, zach Eady, and even with uh, some more pieces certainly to come that is mostly i i do believe in braden smith and fletcher lawyer as good college guards they've won a lot even if Monday night wasn't the best night for them. I think Trey Crawford Wren has a breakthrough season. I don't think Purdue is going to slip to irrelevancy or even too far. Matt Painter has been running one of the best programs in the country, even before Zach Eady became a superstar. And I believe he'll continue to do that even after Zach Eady is in the NBA. When we come back, we'll tear our attention away just for a minute from the NCAA tournament and focus on the coaching carousel at some point today is expected that it will be announced. John Calipari is going to be the next head coach at the university of Arkansas, which means Kentucky is going to probably barring some last minute breakdown, going to have to find a new basketball coach and multiple men who would make reasonable candidates have already publicly indicated. They're not really interested in doing it. What's going to happen in Lexington. We'll talk about that next. It's the Ion college basketball podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball podcast. As of 940 Pacific on Tuesday, April 9th, it's still not official. Right now, technically, John Calipari remains the head coach of the Kentucky Wildcats. But reportedly, he is on the verge of formally accepting a deal to be the next head coach at the University of Arkansas, at which point 
the University of Kentucky is going to have to find a new basketball coach. Even before the job is open, there are several people who can't wait to publicly express no interest whatsoever in the job. Our colleague, uh, Jay Wright, CBS Sports, the Naismith Memorial Hall of Famer, has already said he, or at least indicated, publicly indicated that he doesn't have any interest in being the next Kentucky coach. Nate Oates, the Alabama coach, who would be an obvious candidate, at least from my perspective, has publicly indicated he's on, he's going to remain in Tuscaloosa. And Dan Hurley, after winning his second national championship last night, publicly indicated he has no interest in being Kentucky's head coach for a variety of reasons. Among them, he thinks his wife would divorce him if he made her move to the state of Kentucky. So with all that strong jaw, let me ask you what you'd do if you're Mitch Barnhart. If, if we were really operating under the assumption that Jay Wright Dan Hurley, Nate Oates are off limits, and John Calipari's at Arkansas. What do you do next? Yeah, the first thing I do, I think, is probably call Andrea Hurley and say, hey, look, this is the horse <laughs> racing capital of the world. We make very strong drinks here in Kentucky. Uh, just just be open-minded. Um, the second I thing say, I probably I will do say, is I will call. Say, I, I will say on that, uh, during the Friday practice show, I did an on-court interview uh, on CBS Sports Network with Andrea Hurley, just an incredible part. She's so funny and um, just uh, self-deprecating and interesting and thoughtful. She was fabulous, man. Uh, I understand why UConn fans uh, love her. Um, she was just wonderful. So if you could ever get her on your side, if you're Mitch Barnhart, uh, that's a real advantage, but I'm just going to take Dan Hurley. Uh, he knows his wife better than I do. If he says she has no interest in living in Kentucky, I'm going to assume she has no interest in, live, in living in Kentucky. Yeah, I, th I think Dan Hurley is going to stay put at UConn. I would probably okay. call Scott Drew. Uh, I would probably call Sean Miller. I would probably call Rick Pitino, and maybe in that order. Um, you know, I think there's a pretty clear drop off in terms of the tier one candidates uh, that have already kind of ruled themselves out of the mix here, Dan Hurley among them. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think there's there's still some good options out there if you're Mitch Barnhart for Kentucky. Uh, but right now, uh, I think you have to probably first call is going to be to Scott Drew to make him say no. So it's interesting. Nate Oates, I believe just before the national championship game on Monday night, releases a statement on social media, more or less saying, you know, this is where I want to be. I want to do special things here, including win the first national championship in men's basketball. When these types of things happen, it's often one of two things. And I'm not here to try to uh, insist. I know which one it was uh, connected to Nate Oates, but it's usually one of two things. Either you genuinely don't want the job. You know, you just say, I don't want the job because I'm happy where I'm at because you genuinely don't want the job and you're happy where you're at. Other times you release that type of statement because you've already gotten word or your agent has that for whatever reason, wherever this thing goes, they ain't coming to you. Like for whatever reason, they're just not going to get to you. And so rather than have your name just floating out there when you know it's never actually coming your way, let's just end it and, and, and create a perception of incredible loyalty to the University of Alabama and fans obviously eat that stuff up. You know what? Maybe both things are true. Maybe you, Kentucky wasn't going to come Nate Oates' way. And even if they did, Nate Oates was like, I don't care. I'm staying at Alabama. It is worth noting he has an estimated $18 million buyout. So it would have been very expensive. But I think this is such an important hire for Kentucky that I wouldn't let money get in the way if it were possible to not let money get into the way. It is worth noting that money did get in the way as it pertains to John Calipari, because I do believe if Mitch Barnhart could have, you know, snapped his fingers, you know, one day after Kentucky was upset by Oakland in the round of 64, two day, two years after Kentucky was upset by St. Peter's in the round of 64, I do believe that Mitch Barnhart would have snapped his fingers and made a coaching change then. Problem was, it wasn't just snapping the fingers. You'd have to snap your fingers and pay $33 million, at least in theory, to John Calipari, although there is offset language in that contract. So they didn't have or either didn't want to spend the money it would take to get rid of John Calipari on their own. That's why this Arkansas thing for them is perhaps a, a blessing on some level. But if I'm Mitch Barnhart, I'm going, if Arkansas is going to invest this type of money into basketball, into a coach, in the same league that we're competing in, we're supposed to be Big Blue Nation. We're supposed to be Kentucky. Would we really let something like an $18 million buyout stand in the way of the guy we want if that is indeed the guy that we want? 
I wouldn't. If I were the University of Kentucky, I'd figure it out. I would have made Nate Oates tell me no, but it appears either Nate mm -hmm. Oates um, isn't an option or he's already told you no publicly because Nate Oates has uh, pled his allegiance, at least for now, to the University of Alabama. The names you listed are all good, all sensible. I wouldn't be shocked if it fell to Mark Pope, who, of course, is a Kentucky grad mm -hmm. member of a national championship team with the Wildcats. Um, I also don't think it's crazy to call Rick Patino. I don't know that they'll do it, but like if you told me, hey, next season Rick Patino is coaching Kentucky, how's that going to go? Like I'd be real interested in it. And it would obviously be a larger than life sports story. So I don't think it's crazy. I don't know that they'll do it, but I don't think it's bananas. The one name you didn't mention, or at least if you mentioned, perhaps it slipped by me, um, that I think is at least worth a phone call and a serious conversation is Billy Donovan. Now I know Billy Donovan has turned mm -hmm. them down multiple times. But Billy Donovan is at a different place in his life right now. And college basketball is at a different place than it was when Billy Donovan left this sport. I don't want to speak for Billy. I'll let him do that someday. But I, I know that he was very frustrated with recruiting and everything that went into it as his years at Florida started to wind down. I can remember standing with him at Peach Jam one day, and this totally random guy walks up. Billy and I are in the middle of a conversation, and this totally random guy walks up to us. I didn't know him. Billy clearly did. Turns out he was a grassroots coach at some level connected to some prospect. And he comes up to Billy Donovan right in the middle of Peach Jam, and he says, Coach Donovan. Now, keep in mind, he ain't supposed to talk to him at this point. That's an NCAA violation, but this grassroots coach, he's coming right up to it. He said, Coach Donovan, I need you to call me when you get back home, and it's okay to call because I got to talk to you about this and this and this and then I might need some tickets to this and I was going to see if you could help me with that and this and this and that and that and Billy just sort of nodded along and like you know did was respectful but also in 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 uh not in violation of NCAA rules and this guy walks away and again forgive me Billy if I'm telling secrets I don't think he would mind this story and he looks right at me and he says do you realize I've won two national championships and and, and I'm still in a position where when I get home I got to spend an hour on the phone with that guy or else I can't do my job well <laughs> And that drives me crazy. Like I shouldn't have to talk to that person for an hour on the phone later tonight. But if I don't, I'm not doing my job well. And that drove him and it drove lots of people crazy. Well, now mm -hmm. recruiting is much more transactional than it's ever been. Once upon a time, at least what coaches would tell you is we got to show up at every AAU game. And we got to show up at every high school thing we can show up to. And we got to know mama and daddy and girlfriend and brother and cousin and everybody else because that's the way you build relationships to recruit. Well, you know how you recruit now? You walk in the door. You say, I'm Billy Donovan. Here's $500,000 in NIL money to come play at Kentucky. Are you interested? It's just much more transactional. I think easier as long as you have the resources to make it easy. And at Kentucky, you always should. The thing that complicates the situation, of course, is Billy Donovan is still in this moment coaching the Chicago Bulls, and they are going to be in the play-in in the Eastern Conference postseason. But that could all be over very quickly. Like, the Chicago Bulls season could be over, you know, late next week, I believe. And, again, the same way I say I would have made Nate Oates tell me no, once again, if I'm Mitch Barnhart, and Mitch, I know he's told you no many times before, but, again, does Billy Donovan want to keep coaching a whatever team in the Eastern Conference, or is it maybe time to bounce back to college basketball where he would, I think, immediately, based on NIL resources available to him, have one of the best teams in the country um, in year one, uh, just on the idea that the cashy that, that accompanies him to the sport and the NIL resources he would have available to him, presumably, would allow him to roster build in a way that could, could flip that program very, very quickly. Would you, does any of that make sense to you? Billy Donovan should at least have to tell you, nope, I love the NBA too much. I got no interest. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I think that is a very reasonable plan. It's Billy Donovan. Uh, this is a guy right. who's won multiple national championships. Uh, the resources at Kentucky, um, you can match up with just about anyone in college basketball. Donovan's situation in particular, I think, is interesting because, yes, the, the Bulls might be in the play-in. Uh, but, you know, the Bulls are really not in a spot where they are at the top of their conference. They're not contending for NBA championships. And Donovan's job security, I think for now, is is probably safe. But it could be a situation where, similar to John Calipari, he maybe sees the writing on the wall and decides, hey, look, this is a great situation. 
They love me. They want me. I have a ton of resources here. The college game has changed. Maybe his heart has changed. So all of those factors to consider, I think, for Billy Donovan. Um, again, yes, if you're Mitch Barnhart, absolutely make the phone call, make him tell you no, and then make him tell you no again. Uh, but I, I can't imagine this is going to happen. I think that, you know, eventually Kentucky's going to have to end up moving down the list. When we come back, one more segment, and we'll close it by looking ahead to next season. Yes, I have already filed the top 25 and one. I'll tell you who's number one next. It's the Ion College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast. One more segment to go, and it's never too early to look ahead, even if it feels like it's sometime because uh, the transfer portal was full. And even things that have happened since we started talking 54 minutes ago will change the version 1.0 of the top 25 and one. But heading into this offseason, Strong Joe, I've got Houston, Kelvin Sampson's Cougars at number one in the top 25 and one based on the idea that they're going to return every rotation player besides Damian Dunn from a team that won the Big 12 and was a number one seed in the NCAA tournament. Yes, that uh, would require Jamal Shedd uh, to be back at Houston, but given that he's not an obvious NBA prospect, I think his best option is probably going to be back with the Cougars. LJ Cryer, within the past hour, has announced he's returning to Houston's program. So if Houston really is returning every rotation piece besides Damian Dunn, mm. do you agree, Kyle, that Houston should be number one, at least in this moment right now? I wouldn't rank Houston in the top 25. No, I, I tried to make a case that I wouldn't. I tried to make a case that Houston should not be number one. And the answer was Houston should be number one. I agree with you. This is obvious. Uh, LG Cryer is coming back. Jamal Shedd could return. Um, you look at the computer numbers, and we love the computer numbers. Houston, for the most part, this season was number one um, in the computer numbers. They are the most physical team in college basketball. Um, one of the most well-coached teams in college basketball, Kelvin Sampson is a great coach. Um, and I think regardless of the pieces, and I think the pieces will be very good, uh, Houston will be in the mix for the number one spot. I think you can make a case for Duke. They bring in Cooper Flagg and the number one recruiting class. Uh, you can make a case for Kansas. Uh, they bring in Zeke Mayo, Riley Kugel, a couple, a couple of transfers. And I think they will be better than they were this past season. But to me, I think it's Houston pause everyone else in college basketball next season again it's way too early probably to go out on a limb and say definitively what it's going to look like next season um, but yeah I think right now Houston is the clear number one in college basketball ahead of next season North Carolina is another reasonable option assuming RJ Davis is back they could return for their top six scores reasonably from a team that you know was a one seed in the NCAA tournament Iowa State is another option T.J. Osterberger could reasonably return the top four scores from a team that won 29 games and was a number two seed in the NCAA tournament. Auburn, I honestly think, is an option, at least for the top five. Um, but within the past hour, Aiden Holloway, the former McDonald's All-American, has announced that he's eating, entering the transfer portal. So I'll have to, just as soon as we get off the air, jump back into the file and start updating. And if you're wondering how I'm going to spend April, May, June, July, August, September, and October, it will be in part consistently updating the top 25 and one. Given the transfer portal, if we eventually get to version 27,000, it wouldn't surprise me. Wish me luck. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry Teagle. He's the legend. Hucklar now. Thank you guys for watching the Ion College Basketball Podcast. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll talk to you next time.